Well, I would imagine <clears throat> I'm not the only one who has had this uh, experience I'm about to talk about. You probably have too, but I'm kind of curious how you respond to it when it does happen. You're leaving the house for the day. You're going to be out like most of the day. Maybe you're going to work, going to school. You got a long day planned, and you leave the house and you realize you left your phone at home. How do you feel? Now, I, what I want to know is how far do you have to go until you decide you're not going to go back and get it? Like if you're five miles or five minutes away from home, are you going to turn around and go get it? Is it like worth that 10 minute round trip? Most of you would say, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, but maybe it depends on your age, how you're going to answer this. Um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, you still turn it around. You get all the way there. You're there. It's like 40 minutes away. Are you thinking, yeah, it's worth the hour and four, 20 minute round trip or whatever to go and get my phone? Most, <laughs> most of us have a hard time imagining living the day without our phone, right? So here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that you are leaving your house for a place that is so exciting. You are leaving your house for an experience that is so captivating to, to be with somebody that you can't wait to be with, that you're just one minute away from your house and you realize that you have forgotten your phone and you don't care. This event is going to be so amazing that you're like, I don't care that I don't have my phone. I don't need my phone. I mean, what event would it be? What person would it be? What experience would it be for you to think that way about leaving your phone at home? Now, many of you are saying well, anything. I mean, I don't really care about my phone, but others of you are thinking, what could possibly be that good? Well, last week we started this series called That Day, and that day, of course, is the day that Jesus said when he would come again a second time. Now, this is a theme. That day is a theme that is developed all throughout the Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we began to unpack it last week, and we saw some very common principles about that day that we find in the Bible, and we saw that that day is going to be bad news for some and good news for others. For some, it is going to be a day of judgment. For those who have continued to hold on to the rebellion and hold on to their hard-heartedness and continue to rebel against God and, and refuse his gift of, of grace and life and love, that day will be a day of condemnation and destruction. But the Bible also points out that that day is going to be a day of amazing news for those who have trusted in Christ for the saved because that is going to be a day of deliverance and redemption. That on that day, you and I are going to get new bodies, bodies that never wear out or grow old. On that day, we are going to be reunited with loved ones. On that day, we're going to see Jesus face to face. On that day, we are going to be ushered into a, a new life and a new world where we're going to be able to experience and discover and explore and learn new things for all eternity. And so what we said at the very beginning was that because that day is coming and that day is going to be so monumental and it's going to be good news for some, bad news for others, because it's going to impact our eternity, it should impact the way I live today. That day should impact this day. And so what we said we're going to do is we're going to look at four biblical New Testament passages that talk about that day and implications for how I should live this day because of that day. And if you were with us last week, we began by looking at one of the teachings of Jesus on this topic where he says, you know, although we can know that day is certainly coming, we can't know when it's going to be. We don't know the day or the hour. Nobody does. And therefore, Jesus said it's going to come unexpectedly and so that we should live this day as though it could be that day, that we should live in a state of preparedness, of readiness. And what we saw is that to be ready doesn't require any special knowledge, any special ability. I don't have to like, reach some level of holiness or moral perfection. I don't have to stack up all my good deeds on the scale so that by that day they outweigh the bad deeds. But that to be ready for that day simply means to be in a faith relationship with Jesus. To be ready for that day, all I need to be doing is prioritizing a relationship with him, believing he is who he said he was, that he did what he said he, he did, and he's going to do what he said he's going to do. I just need to prioritize a relationship with him. And so we began this series, end this year, by asking this question, what if we live this day and every day this year as though it could be that day? And we talked about prioritizing our relationship with Jesus. And we talked about the, the, the tool that we use here at New Day, the personal growth plan. I want to let you know, I set aside prayerful time this week. And I put together my kind of pathway uh, to stay connected to Jesus in 2019. And I'm really excited about it. And I've begun to implement it. And I, I've been experiencing God's presence in my life as I kind of cut out time just to kind of prioritize him and my relationship with him in my life. And I hope you, that you're doing that on a daily basis as well. And we talked about ways to, things to implement in that plan. 
But today I want to, 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 to move to another teaching of Jesus and find the second implication of what that day should have on this day. And today we move away from Matthew chapter 24 to Luke chapter 17. Now we're going to see some similarities between these two teachings of Jesus. But they start for different reasons. In Matthew chapter 24, the whole conversation on that day is started by the disciples when they come to Jesus and they ask him, when will that day be? And Jesus gives that long discourse in Matthew 24 and 25. Well, in Luke chapter 17, the conversation starts because the Pharisees actually come to Jesus and ask him, when will that day be? Everybody wanted to know, when will that day be? And so the Pharisees come to him and Jesus answers very differently. There's some similarities, but there's some differences. He begins by t- talking somewhat mystically about the kingdom and how it's already in your midst and you're not going to be able to, you know, it's, it's here, but it's not here. And then he talks about some of the signs of that day. And then he says, that day can't come until the Son of Man suffers and is rejected, speaking of his crucifixion. But then he moves into a, a teaching that, if you were here last week, will be familiar, or maybe you've read this before. But he points to a historical event, a, a historical event of judgment And he compares it, he uses it as an illustration for that day. This is what he says in Luke chapter 17, verse 26. He says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so also will it be in the days of the Son of Man. On that day, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. So Jesus is using Noah and his flood as an illustration of that day. Um, Now, again, um, What he's pointing to is the fact that we don't know when it's going to come. You know, one of the things the Bible points out about this generation before Noah's flood is that it was exceedingly rebellious, exceedingly violent. It was exceedingly unjust and immoral. Yet the things that they're doing here that Jesus talks about, eating, drinking, marrying, they're not bad things. They're just life things. And so the point that Jesus is making is that this generation lived every day as though life would continue to go on as it is now forever. That judgment would never come. But that day came when no one in the dark, that day came suddenly, unexpectedly. And therefore, the lesson for us is live this day as though it could be that day. But now he's going to point to a second, he's going to take this now farther, he's going to point to a second historical event, a historical day of judgment, to take this point a bit deeper. He goes on, he says, it was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building, but the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, No one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. All right, so Jesus uses these two historical events, events of judgment, to make these points about what that day will be like. First of all, Noah, be ready. You don't know when it's coming. But now he turns to the story of Lot to give us new lessons and a new implication for how we can make this day like that day. Now, the story of Lot and his wife is found in Genesis chapter 19, first book of the Bible. And, and, and to be honest, it's a troubling story. If you know the story, it causes, creates all kinds of questions, stirs things up. As a matter of fact, if you're here today and, and you don't consider yourself to be a Christian, this may be one of the stories you would point to to say, this is why I, I'm not sure I could be a follower of God. Because, I mean, why did, would God destroy a whole city or two cities? And why would Lot like, respond to the issue by offering up his daughters and place of these visitors? And It's a tough story. But let's go ahead and look at it and see what we can learn. What, what is Jesus talking about when he says, remember Lot's wife? Well, Lot was uh, a relative of one of the father, the father of our faith, Abraham. He was Lot, uh, Abraham's nephew. And the two of them were actually doing life together for, for quite a while. Um, they were living side by side, but they got so prosperous, they had so many herds, so many flocks, so many servants, that the land could no longer support the two of them together. So they, they decided that they needed to separate. And Lot decided that he was going to go into the Jordan Valley and live in or near Sodom, and Abraham would, would go on to live in Canaan. Well, as we get to Genesis chapter 18, Abraham welcomes these three heavenly visitors. He didn't know at the time they were heavenly, but they were like angelic, or it was God, or Jesus. I mean, these are, are divine beings that come to him, and they have a meal together. And after the meal, God begins to have this conversation with Abraham. 
And he's revealing to Abraham his plans to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He says that their, their wickedness has reached epic levels and the cries have come up to me from people who are suffering from their injustice and so it is time that I'm going to destroy them. Well, Abraham is shocked by this. He's startled by this because he knows that his nephew and his his family lives in that region and he wants to protect them. And so he begins this almost comical negotiation with God over saving the cities of Sodom and, and Gomorrah. And he says, Lord, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? And we know that God will not because we're going to see in the story that God's going to save every righteous person in those cities that he possibly can. So the answer is no, but God lets the kind of the conversation play itself out. And, and so Abraham says, if, if you could find 50 righteous people in those cities, w- would you spare them? And God says, yes, if, I could, if, if we could find 50 righteous people in those cities, we will spare them. Well, that makes Abraham feel kind of emboldened. And so he kind of pushes God a little bit farther like not trusting God's mercy. And so he says, what about 45? Are you going to destroy them for the sake of like five people? Would you save them for 45 people? And God's like, I will save the cities. I will spare them for 45 people. Well, then Abraham continues this kind of negotiation. He goes to 40 people, then 30 people, then 20 people, then 10 people. And God says, if we can find 10 righteous people, we'll save the cities. And it has to make you wonder, why did, God, why did Abraham stop at 10? Right? Why did he not go to three or two or one? Because in the end, only four righteous people could be found in the cities. Well, um, because only four could be found, God sends two angels into Sodom to warn Lot and his families. And as these angels come in, again, they just look like people, they, they come into to Sodom and Lot is there at the city gates. And he welcomes these, these, these uh, visitors and he says, hey, come to my house, I'll feed you a meal, you can stay at my house. And the guy's like, no, that's fine, we'll just stay here in the, the city park, we'll be, we'll be good. But Lot knows his city, you do not want to stay in the city park, really. Come with me, let me feed you, let me put you up for the night. And so these guys go with him, they have a meal, and we pick the story up in Genesis chapter 19, verse 4. It says, before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can blank, blank with them. There are parts of the Bible that are so real, that are so graphic, that I don't feel comfortable reading them in church with children present. And so you can figure out what those blanks are. It's not so that we can talk turkey with them. It's not so that we can play cards with them. It's not so that we can go walking with them. All right. If you don't know what's happening here, think of the name Sodom and think about just look it up in your Bible or ask the person next to you. It's bad. This is the culture, though, of Sodom and Gomorrah. And what we see is that this is not some isolated issue. This isn't just a couple bad seeds. But look at what the Bible writer says. It says, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. This is a systemic issue. And this is what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what, how's Lot going to respond to this? Well, verse uh, 6 says, Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them, but don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Now here's where we're like, what? Did Lot really just say that? Did he just offer up his two daughters to be abused by this gang and probably murdered? And the answer to that question is maybe. That is one way of reading it. He may have actually been saying exactly what it sounds like he is saying because that is how far they would take Middle Eastern hospitality in, still to this day, that in Middle Eastern hospitality, that if you welcomed a guest into your house, you were responsible to provide for them and take care of them and protect them, even if it meant the safety and the life of your family members and of yourself. So Lot may be saying exactly what we think he's saying, but there's another way to read this. Lot could also have an edge of sarcasm to this comment. Like, do you want to just take my virgin daughters and abuse them? Will you go that far? It's like if you or I were being foreclosed on by a mortgage company, we would call them up and say to them, do you want to just take the clothes right off my children's back and the food off my kids' plates? Would you go that far? And if we were to take this reading of the verse, 
Um, what Lot is actually doing with this kind of subtle, sarcastic comment is trying to prick the conscience of this unruly mob, trying to say, look at what you're, you're doing. Are you willing to go this far? But whatever he's doing and however he's saying it, the point is the crowd is willing to go that far because their, their consciences are not pricked. They continue on and they say in verse 9, get out of our way. This fellow came here as a foreigner and now he wants to play the judge? We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. Well, the whole time the angels are like in the house and they're not doing anything to this point, but they finally get involved in the story. At this point, they open the door, they reach out, they grab Lot, they pull him back in, they lock the door, and then they strike everyone outside the door, the mob with a, a temporary blindness. Like, okay, why didn't you do that before? Um, all right. But they do it. So everyone's blind. They can't find the door of the house. And then the angels gather the family together and they tell them why they've come. The city is about to be destroyed. You need to get out of here. You got to get all your family out of here. Go and tell anybody you think who will listen to you, who will believe you. It's time to go. The city's about to be destroyed. And so the only people Lot can think would possibly listen to him and believe him are his sons-in-law, who were probably men who were pledged to be married to his daughters, because you remember they have never been with a man. So, so he goes to these guys who are pledged to be married to his daughters and he tells them, hey, the city's about to be destroyed. you got to come with us. And they laugh at him. They mock him. They think he's lost his mind or he's some kind of a, a fanatic or a crazy lunatic. And they laugh at him. So the time comes. It's time to go, Lot. When dawn comes, the, the story continues. It says, with the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, now I got to stop right there because, I mean, this is amazing. So think about what Lot had just been through. He had just seen this mob come and nearly kill his family or his daughters. Traumatic experience, violence, evil. He had seen these angels strike everybody blind. So they had worked a miracle. He had seen it just a couple hours before. Now it's dawn. These guys are telling him the city's about to be destroyed. And what does Lot do? As it, he says, flee, he hesitates. Why does he hesitate? I, I can think of a couple reasons that are possible. Maybe he's hesitating because he loves the people around him. And he wants to like, he, he just can't leave him. He wants to die with him. I don't know. Or maybe he loves his stuff and his house so much that he's not willing to leave it. Or maybe he's doubting these angels, even though he just saw the miracle that they performed. Maybe he's, is, oh, come on, is destruction really coming? But for whatever reason, Lot, this supposedly righteous man, hesitates when the angels say, get out. And how does God respond to his hesitation? Well, I tried to warn you. You know, I tried to save you, but if, you, if you're not going like, to listen to like, the mob and, and, and the blindness, if that's not enough... See ya! Is that what God does? When he hesitated, the men, the angels, grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city for the Lord was merciful to them. I just love that part of the story. Did you ever catch that before? I mean, talk about seeing the heart of God to save humanity. Right in the middle of the story, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, when we think about that day, I don't know, and Phil was talking a little bit about the nervousness that we could feel as we think about that day. Well, will I really be saved? Do I have enough faith? Have I been good enough? You know, we wonder about whether we're going to be ready to be saved. I remember when I was a, a brand new Christian, or early in my walk with Jesus in my 20s, I would have these dreams. You know, I would think about that day, and I would have these dreams. Maybe you've had similar things where I have a dream where Jesus has come again, and I look up, I see him there, and I, I start to lift off the ground, like the Bible says I'll do, to kind of meet him in the air. And I'll get about five or six feet off the ground, and I'll like slowly start like sinking back down again, <laughs> like, a, like a balloon that doesn't have enough helium. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> Wondering, do I have enough faith to be saved? on that day. But look at what God does for Lot and his family. Lot is hesitating. I'm not even sure I want to go. And the angel grabs them by the hand. Each angel has two people that he's dragging out of the city, dragging them practically to safety. And why does he do it? For the Lord was merciful to them. And you may say, well, why wasn't the Lord merciful with everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah? Why did he rain down fire? Where's the mercy in that? God wanted to be merciful to every person in Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible makes it clear God does not want anyone to be lost, but everyone to be saved. But we have to be open to it. We have to be open. The only reason that Lot and his wife and his daughters were drugged out of the city was because they were somewhat open to the mercy of God. 
And God took advantage of it and he drug them out of the city. No one else was even open to it. But the thing that we need to see is the reason that Lot was saved, the reason he and his wife and his daughters were drugged to salvation and deliverance was not because of anything great about them. It wasn't because of what they, they did or their righteousness or because Lot had attained some moral standing where he was some great guy. It was because of the mercy of God. And when that day comes for us, we will be saved for the same reason. Not because of what I have done, but because of what he has done. Because of the mercy of God. Jesus has done everything necessary to save me and to save you. And he is continuing to work at it. Not only was he crucified for my sin, not only did he rise again to conquer the grave, not only did he ascend back to heaven so he could intercede for you and me before the Father. But, but I love what it says in the book of Romans in the Bible. It says that he, God, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? In other words, God has already so much invested in you and in your salvation. He's given the life of his son to save you. And you think he's going to start like making it hard now for you to get there? He's like going to start putting up obstacles? No, he's going to give us everything necessary for salvation. He will drag us there if necessary, if he finds us hesitating. Why? Because of his mercy. But we've got to be open to it. Not everyone will be saved because God will not force his salvation on everyone as we see in the case of Lot's wife. Let's continue the story. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, the angels, flee for your lives. Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. Then, oh, let's, uh, let's stop right there actually because at that point, Lot kind of does this negotiation thing with the angels. He's like, uh, for whatever reason, I don't want to go to the mountains. Don't make me go to the mountains. There's a city close by named Zor. Can I go there? And the angels are like, fine, go to Zor. Don't go to the mountains. But here's just a little quick aside here on the story. It's like we have these people continually negotiating with God over these parts of the story, and God seems really flexible. Have you noticed that? It's like, will you save them for 10? Yeah, I'll save them for 10. Fine, go ahead. I don't want to go to the mountains. I want to go to Zor. Fine, go to Zor. It's like, God seems like really like reasonable. It's like if we got this, wouldn't we pray a whole lot more? Maybe negotiate with God, like pray for the people around us, the needs of the people around us, the salvation of the people around us. He seems really willing to listen. But they say, fine, go to Zor. And it's about, the Bible says it's about when the sun was high that uh, they reached Zor and the destruction began. And so we believe that Zor is probably about five or ten miles away from Sodom. Uh, and so they get there, and then once they get to Zor, what happens? Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land, letting us know it was, it was complete. But Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. All right, here we go. So all the land is destroyed. The cities are destroyed. Lot's wife looks back, she becomes a pillar of salt. So now we get to the part of Jesus' teaching that we started with where he said, remember Lot's wife. So what are we supposed to remember about Lot's wife? That she looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now, I remember how I thought about this when I was a kid. Okay, and also probably when I was an adult too. Maybe you think about it like this too. That Because I, I remember being a kid, I saw there was a movie on TV about the Bible. And it had this story in the movie. And it kind of shows Lot and his wife, you know, running away from Sodom and Gomorrah. And there's all this destruction behind them. And they've been told, don't look back. If you look back, it's like looking at Medusa's face. You know, you're going to be turned into a pillar of stone, right? And so they're running away. And Lot's wife cannot stand the temptation. She has to look. And so she looks over her shoulder and uh, she becomes this hideous pillar of salt. Maybe that's the way you kind of think about this. But I'm here to tell you, I don't think that's what happened. Lot's wife did not disobey the angel by glancing over her shoulder. That's not what this is about. But the text and what Jesus teaches us, the implication is that Lot's wife didn't disobey the angel by glancing over her shoulder. She disobeyed the angel by going back to Sodom and dying with the rest of the people there. Let me, let me build my case. First of all, look at the command that the angel gave. It's a three-part command, and they're all saying basically the same thing. Flee for your lives. Don't look back. Don't stop anywhere in the plane. In other words, go, 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 right? So in that context, don't look back means don't go back. 
right? And, and then consider this. God waited for them to get to Zor before the destruction began. And so everyone in Zor and probably Lot and his daughters were probably standing on the, the walls of the city watching what was happening just five miles away. There was no harm in watching what was happening. But I think that the nail in the coffin on this argument is what Jesus himself said in his illustration. Look what he says. He says, on that day, listen to what he says. No one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. Nobody should go back to the house. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. So what Jesus is telling us is that Lot's wife didn't look back. Lot's wife went back. You see? So the implications for that is that I mean, you, you picture it being it happening. You know, they're, they're running away. Maybe they get about a mile outside the city and nothing's happening. And Lot's wife is saying, Lot, this is ridiculous. We're, we're running away on the word of these two guys. What do we know about them? And we've got our house back there. And I don't know, you can continue, but I'm going home. And I'll see you in a day or two when you come to your senses, but I'm going back. And she goes back to Sodom and she is destroyed and turned into a pillar of salt with the rest of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. And here's what really baffles me is what did she go back for? Life in Sodom? Like, was that attractive? I mean, after what she had just experienced the night before, I mean, maybe that was just normal life in Sodom. Maybe just the mobs every night were doing that, and that was like their normal. I mean, what did she have in Sodom to go back and be lost for while the rest of her family is being carried to deliverance? I, I, I just don't get it, but here's... I think the point of the story for me, and maybe you'll resonate with this, is that Lot's wife, when Jesus says, remember Lot's wife, what he's saying is Lot's wife didn't want to be saved because she did not believe that what God was going to provide for her in her future was as good as what she was being asked to leave behind. Lot's wife did not have the one thing necessary to be saved. Faith. And how this intersects with our stories. I can't tell you how many times I have thought this or talked to people who said, I'm not sure I'm willing to follow Jesus. I'm not sure I'm willing to give all of me to Jesus because I'm afraid of what he's going to ask me to let go of. In Sodom. Something that could never compare to what he actually wants to give us. Oh, I, 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 you know, I'm afraid that I've, I become a Christian. He's going to ask me to stop drinking or stop sleeping with my girlfriend or he's going to ask me to do whatever it is that I think is so amazing because I don't believe that what he wants to give me is as good as what he's asking me to leave behind. I don't have faith that God is that good. That's what Jesus says. That's his point for that day, for you and me. He says, on that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go down to get them. And that day, they, they had these flat rooftops, and they would spend a lot of time up there on those flat rooftops, and they would have a, a stairwell on the outside of the house. Jesus is saying, don't worry about, when that day comes, don't worry about going back inside. He says, likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. His point Nothing that is behind you is as good as what is before you when that day comes. When Jesus finally comes, let's say you get kind of pulled out of your house, there's an earthquake or something's happening or you hear something and you get pulled out of your house and you look up at the sky, you're like, oh, Jesus is coming. This is that day. Are you going to feel like you have to go back in your your house and get your phone? I need my phone. I got a selfie this. You know, Jesus in the background. Or if, or if you've got, you know, supper's cooking. Time out, Jesus. I got to go turn the stove off. Like, this is really important. Or I'm in the middle of an email. Can I finish it, please? I got to hit send. Or I got to check my bank statements. No, it's all ridiculous, right? It's like, what can we possibly go back for on that day that is going to be as good as what is right before us? And that's why Jesus ends this teaching, or at least the part I'm going to talk about, by saying this. He says, remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life will preserve it. So Lot's wife, she tried to preserve her life. She clung to her life. Life in Sodom. And she lost her life. But Lot, on the other hand, hesitation and all, was willing to leave everything, including his wife, He left it behind, and he was able to find life. (sighs) 
as I think about applying this, you know, what does this mean for us? How do I live this day like it could be that day? It strikes me that there's no like one size fits all application for this because we're talking about issues of the heart, really. I mean, as we apply this to possessions, for instance, like holding on loosely to my possessions. That's what Jesus is really saying. Hold on loosely to this life. Hold on loosely to to, to, to possessions, the experiences of this life because something better is happening. You know, the things that I have a hard time letting go of may not be an issue for you and vice versa, right? So I can't say, so hold on loosely to this or that, you know. And in the same way, what we're talking about here is not, not owning things, not having possessions. We need to have possessions, but what we're talking about here is not allowing our things to possess us, right? And so this is an issue of the heart, and so it's very hard to have this like universal application, like we all need to do this or we all need to stop doing that. And so I thought it would be better just to maybe end with a couple questions for us all to consider. And, and, and here's the first one. What would we go back for when Jesus comes? What is there behind us that could be better for, for th- than what lies before us. This applies today and it applies on that day. What would we go back for? Now, let me just say, I get it. The apprehension that we have about that day and, and, and could what God has in store for us in heaven be as good as life in Douglas County? Could it possibly be that good? But here's the conclusion I've come to. I think about the things that move me, the things that make me feel most alive listening to the Les Mis soundtrack until I cry at the end, you know, seeing a great work of art or a sunset or being with people that I love and having meaningful conversation, talking about Jesus with somebody who loves Jesus. I mean, these are the things that make me feel so alive. And here's the thing that I've realized. All of those are from God and all of those are a shadow of what he is preparing for us in the next life. And so when I have those moments where my heart just soars and stirs or breaks over beautiful things or feels most alive, that is just a taste of what Jesus has waiting for us on that day. Or how how about this question? What are the things in this world that make us desire his continued delay? Let's just get real, right? I mean, Pretty much, if, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's probably been times you're like, okay, Jesus, you can wait a little bit longer. I just got a new car, and it's sweet. You know, I want to drive this car for a while. You know, or I got a new girlfriend, a new boyfriend, or I'm just getting ready to get married. Lord, you can kind of wait till after that. I'd like to have some kids. Or you know, my retirement account's pretty sweet. I'd like to spend it, Jesus, if that's okay with you. And again, it is a lack of faith that what Jesus is going to give us in the first seconds of eternity could possibly compare with what we would leave behind in this life. It is all a shadow. What, I, I just believe that in the first two seconds of eternity, we're going to be like, why did we want to wait for this? This is amazing. I got to tell you, I have a pretty comfortable life. I'm almost ashamed about how comfortable my life is. I, I know that I have brothers and sisters around the world who are struggling. Brothers and sisters in this country who are struggling. I have a comfortable life. But I recently had an experience where that comfort was threatened. And and we were looking at a huge income loss. And, you know, God could have certainly been in it. But we were going to have to step down our lifestyle and maybe enter into the kind of poverty. And, you know, I got to tell you, I'm ashamed to say I struggled with that. Uh, I was like, wow, do I have what it takes to kind of live without some of these comforts that I've kind of surrounded myself with? But it was in that experience that the the Holy Spirit whispered to me through that still small voice, hold on loosely to your possessions. Your life does not consist of the things that you own or the things in this life. That what I have in store for you in this life and in the next are so much greater than those things that you think are so necessary for a meaningful existence. And so as you consider living this day as though it could be that day in 2019, What would that look like as you apply that to your possessions, to your life? Would it mean that maybe you're a bit more generous, open-handed, that you would share things a bit more, that you'd invite more people in, that you'd give more away, that you would not think that you need this or that quite as much as you feel that you do? Something to consider. Because Jesus encourages us to remember Lot's wife. And as a result, to hold on loosely to this life in our possession. So on that day, we'll be able to fly away and experience everything Jesus has in store for us. Yeah? Let's pray together.
Our God, thank you for the world that you are creating for us, for the beauty that we could experience in this life, for the good that we experience in this life. But we just want to say in faith that it pales in comparison to what you have in store for us. And may we live this day as though it could be that day by holding on loosely to this life and the things in it. Give us strength to know what to do, wisdom to know what to do, and courage to do it, no matter how hard it may be. And we pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen.